Good morning, and thank you for viewing today's live stream. You know, it's inevitable that sometime during today, you will be tempted by someone or something. We're tempted by what we see on television. We're tempted by what we hear on the radio. And we're even tempted by things that other people have. And there are all sorts of temptations woven into the very fabric of our daily lives. And at times, it's difficult to stand up against this tidal wave of temptation. So in our message today titled, A World of Temptation, I'll be sharing with you three temptations that Satan has devoted to the destruction of believers in Christ. But before we move on to our text, please bow with me in prayer. Gracious God, our Father, first of all, we come to you today in the holy and in the mighty name of Jesus. And Lord, I pray that you will speak through me as you have me to speak to your people. I pray that at the conclusion of this message, that we will have a better understanding of the subtleness that the enemy uses against us with the temptations of the world. Help us to grasp and understand that greater is he that is within you than he that is in the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The scripture for today's message title, A World of Temptation, is found in John, 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. And the word of the Lord reads on this wise, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. Amen. A world of temptation. Now the word world in verse 16 of our scripture passage is a system of man-made government and societies that are corruptible and deteriorating and will eventually be destroyed. The world is an environment of sin consisting of lust, pride, evil, and rebellion against God. Why? Because Satan is the prince of this world. We live in a world of temptation. And in today's message, I'll be discussing three temptations in this world that Satan uses to tempt, entice, and destroy believers in Christ. And they are, first, the lust of the flesh. Second, the lust of the eyes. And third, the pride of life. Now, let me start by saying, first of all, God doesn't tempt anyone. Temptation never comes from God. And we know this because James chapter 1, verse 13 says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempted he any man. So if anyone ever tells you that God tempted them, you need to direct them to James chapter 1. Now, when we look at these three temptations in our text, we see that they are multifaceted, meaning that every sin there is come from one of these three. They all work in sinister collaboration to lead us astray so that we are foul for Satan's schemes. Christians have always been and will always be enticed by these same three temptations while in this world. And Satan doesn't change his methods. He doesn't have to because the one he's been using are working just fine. So let's look at each of these temptations in our text individually, starting with the first temptation, the lust of the flesh. Now this temptation is a craving for what is directly forbidden by God rather than for what is allowed. It is a desire that satisfies any of your physical needs. Lust of the flesh is seen with King David in the 11th chapter of 2 Samuel. Here you have King David, man after God's own home, who had all of the trappings of what he desired as the king of Israel. He had a grand palace, several wives, earthly riches and treasures, and most of all, the favor of God. But despite him having it all, because of the lust of the flesh, it wasn't enough. And one day as he was walking on the roof of his palace, when he should have been with his men at battle, 
He saw a beautiful woman taking a bath. David inquired and found out that her name was Bathsheba and that she was married to Uriah, who was one of his most honored and loyal soldiers. As David looked upon Bathsheba. He was overcome with a strong desire and lust for her. And out of his lust of the flesh, a child was conceived, a deceptive scheme was plotted and failed, a murderous plot was devised and succeeded because David had set up a hit job on Uriah and then married his wife. But David, as well as all of us, could benefit from the wisdom of Job who said, I made a covenant with mine eyes. And Job refused to let his eyes see things that he shouldn't have been looking at. But not David. He was lured by his eyes into temptation and he ended up committing adultery, coveting his neighbor's wife, and even had her husband, his loyal soldier, murdered. David was accumulating so much baggage that his baggage had baggage. And guess what? The Lord was displeased and his wrath was brought against the household of David, which affected the entire kingdom. So you can clearly see his kingdom suffered much destruction because of this temptation, the lust of the flesh. When we collectively allow ourselves to be caught up in this temptation, it will also bring about destruction in our world, like in our homes and our jobs, families and communities. But we can avoid this type of destruction simply by doing what the word of God says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, which is walk in the spirit. And ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now let's move on to the second temptation in our text in verse 16, which is the lust of the eyes. The lust of the eyes is an insatiable desire for what the eyes see, wanting to possess what they see. There was a son who had fell hard for a young lady he had met. He told his dad about it. Dad saw all of the excitement in his eyes and he became concerned for his son. And he said, son, he said, now, don't you let that woman sweep you off your feet now. Besides, beauty is only skin deep. The son replied, father, he said, that woman must have some awful deep skin because everywhere I look, I see beauty. Now, Satan is well the world. The potent tool that he has in using our eyes to tempt us. But the question that we should always ask when it relates to what we see is, does this align with the word and will of God? If not, then you better stop believing your lying eyes because Satan is at work. He's orchestrating your deception and downfall. Now, some things to know about the lust of the eyes is they seek to cover the possession of other people. They seek the God forbidden pleasure of the world. They seek after things that are evil and they seek after the God. Now in the 16th chapter of Judges, we see the lust of the eyes playing out in the life of Samson. And Samson possessed extraordinary physical strength which allowed him to kill a lion with brute force, win great battles single-handedly. And once he even killed 1,000 Philistines all by himself with the jawbone of a donkey. And even though he had all this great God-given physical strength, Samson had one great weakness, beautiful women. And it was this weakness that activated his lust of the eyes. And so Samson fell in love with a beautiful Philistine woman named Delilah. And this marked the beginning of his downfall and eventual demise. The Philistine leaders, they, what they did, they came together with a sinister plan to offer Delilah money to uncover the secret of Samson's great strength. And so she launched her plan of temptation to bring about the destruction of Samson. Delilah, she lured Samson in by enticing and seducing him with her beauty. And then she deceived and betrayed him with her charm. Now, that was a powerful one. Before Samson knew it, he was entangled in a strangling web of lies, deception, and trickery, all because of his lust of the eyes for Delilah. And because of all of her schemes, Samson eventually told Delilah that his 
Satan would leave him if a razor were to be used on his head. And somehow I wonder why in the world would he tell a thing like that? He didn't realize it. But he's about to get a haircut in the wrong barbershop. On with his secret. Delilah, she eased him to sleep up on her knees. Then called in a co-conspirator to shave off the seven locks of her on his head. Because of Samson's lust of the eyes. There was great loss and destruction. Taking him down a downward spiral. And the further he spiraled down, the more he lost. Let me tell you about what he lost. He lost the extraordinary strength that God had blessed him with. He lost his eyesight when the Philistine gouged his eyes out. Samson lost his freedom when he was locked up in the Philistine prison. He lost his status as a great warrior when he became a slave to the Philistine. Samson lost, 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 lost until he ultimately lost his life by trying to regain his relationship of favor with God that was given to him at birth. So just like the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes also causes major loss and destruction. So we should not be lured away by what catches our eyes, but should instead do as Colossians chapter 3, verse 2 says, which is set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. So, up to now, we've seen through the lives of David and Samson, devastation that occurs and the corn is left behind when one yields to the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eye. But there's another temptation that Satan uses, which is the most lethal temptation of them all. And that is our third and final temptation, which is the pride of life. Why? Because this temptation driven by unchecked pride and arrogance, which is behind any sin, whether we are aware of it or not. When the pride of life starts boasting, it excites and motivates the other two lusts, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eye to want to jump in and get a piece of the action. Pride of life, it happens when a person is self-centered and focuses on themselves and want people to notice only them. He's a person who mind and thought are primarily on himself. And when you find a person like that, first of all, he's arrogant, he is conceited, he is boastful, he's proud, and he believes himself to be superior to all others. And this was the case with King Nebuchadnezzar, a man of great, great pride, who had his bout with our last temptation, the pride of life as recorded in chapter four of the book of Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, was an empire seeker and builder. And in Daniel chapter four, there is an account of a dream that Nebuchadnezzar had about a tree reached all the way up to heaven and was visible throughout the ends of the earth. And this dream had troubled him so bad, he started calling for everyone in the kingdom to come and explain it. But not a soul could interpret his dream. And so they called for Daniel to give an interpretation because now they knew that God had given him the power to interpret dreams. And so when Daniel came and interpreted the dream for King Nebuchadnezzar, he told him that he said, look, king, he said, you're going to get cast out of this magnificent palace, first of all. And then you're going to live with the, wild, with the wild beast out in the field. You're going to eat grass with the oxen and be wet with the dew of heaven. And then, then king, you're going to stay this way for a total of seven years until you acknowledge that the most high ruler in the kingdom of men. Give it then to whomsoever he will. Then he advised the king to forsake his sinful, his sinful ways and to pursue righteousness instead. But you know what? King refused his advice. And a year later, while he was strolling around, talking about the king, while he was strolling around his palace, during his own shadow, looking at how that great city of Babylon was spread out before it, with the Euphrates River running up the middle, he marveled how the tops of the city walls were wide enough to allow a chariot 
to pass another chariot. And he was impressed by the city's magnificent 300 foot hanging garden, which were one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was then that Satan used the pride of life to tempt him and the king started to boast out of his pride that he had built the entire city. Even though the city existed long before his time, the king's contribution was that he had renovated and beautified it, not built the whole city. While his prideful words were still lingering in his mouth, he heard a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken. Their kingdom is departed from thee. The interpretation that Daniel had told the king was now being repeated to the king, except this time it was God speaking directly to Nebuchadnezzar and not Daniel, his messenger. It's as though this time God was saying, never mind Daniel. I don't need a spokesperson to deliver my message to this pride for king. I handle this myself. You know, sometimes God, when he wants our attention, he doesn't go through a messenger. He deal with us directly, which was the case with Nebuchadnezzar. Within that same hour, God's word was fulfilled and King Nebuchadnezzar was struck with a mental illness called lycanthropy, which is a delusion that caused him to imagine and to start acting like he was a wild beast. King Nebuchadnezzar, he became insane and he started acting like he was an ox. And can you imagine the people looking at their king? Look at it. He was driven, first of all, he was driven from his magnificent palace, just like God said. He was wet with the dew of heaven, like God said. Nebuchadnezzar lived with the beast of the field, just like God said. And then he ate grass like an oxen, like God said. His hair grew like eagle feathers, and his fingernails and toenails grew out like bird claws. And some scholars have even said that he crawled around on all fours, just like he was an animal. And because King Nebuchadnezzar was enticed by the pride of life, he remained in this condition for a total of seven long years, just like the Lord said, said he would. Now, we should learn from this account of Nebuchadnezzar that when the pride of life is deployed, that it will cause massive devastation. So we should heed the warning from God in Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23, which says, Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might, let not the rich man glory in his riches. As believers in Christ, and we must realize that the only thing that we can boast is, is in the Lord. That's what the Apostle Paul told us. David, Samson, and King Nebuchadnezzar all succumbed or gave into the lure of these three powerful temptations of the world. And because of the, rele the release, dissemination, and impact of the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, massive destruction occurred even up to death. And even today, these temptations of the world can and will destroy your relationship. They will destroy your family, they will destroy your church, business, and ultimately you. But it's a fact that in this life, we will have to face these three temptations over and over again, each and every day. But as Christians, we do have the capacity to refrain from yielding to them according to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, which said, Thou had no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will, with the temptation also, make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Now, if we look back at the lives of David, Samson, and Nebuchadnezzar, and although they individually succumbed to the temptations of the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, there are stories didn't end up, thank God. Each one of them had a day of repentance and they all repented for the sin they committed against God. That lets me know that if you blew it in your past and you are still alive today, it's not too late for you to get it right with God. And let's look at David. 
after Nathan had used the parable to show David the evil man he really was instead of the man he thought he was. And David wanted to declare a statue of limitation on himself. He wanted to stop being that person. And he knew that would require not just a change of heart, but a new one. And so David said, create in me a clean heart, O God. And David knew that God was the creator and he could squash that old evil heart and create him a clean one. Then he went on to say, and renew a right spirit within me. And then there was Samson, who on his day of repentance said, Oh Lord God, uh, remember me. And I pray thee and strengthen me. And God answered Samson's prayer, brought sudden destruction on the Philistine at the hands of Samson, who was more than willing to give up his life in order to have favor once again with God. And as for King Nebuchadnezzar, the one who was once so full of pride, we see that after being in the fields, living like an animal for seven years, that when he lifted up his eyes unto heaven, his sanity returned. He humbled himself to God and his kingdom was restored even greater than before. So now in closing, it's important that we learn from these three men and how they were tempted and then overcame. First, the lust of the flesh. David looked at Bathsheba while she was bathing and was overcome with a strong desire and lust of the flesh for her. And because he yielded to his flesh, adultery was committed, a child was conceived, a murder was carried out, and the wrath of God came against the household of David and his kingdom. Second, the lust of the eyes. Samson possessed extraordinary physical strength, but he had a weakness for beautiful women. And so he fell in love with a beautiful Philistine woman named Delilah and who betrayed him, causing him to lose not only his strength, but ultimately his life. And then third, the pride of life. King Nebuchadnezzar, he boasted out of his pride about all that he had accomplished in renovating and beautifying the great city of Babylon. And because of his pride, treatment of the people and his failure to acknowledge God, Lord caused him to live as an animal in the field for seven long years. And these are just a few examples of individuals who were lured away by the temptations of this world. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And you know what? These three temptations are still impacting the world that we live in today. And Satan uses these three temptations draw us away from the will of God, the word of God, and our worship of God in order to bring about the destruction of our relationship with God. So as believers in Christ, we must always be aware of that and, and realize now that we live in a world of temptation that is against God, the ways of God, and the people of God. So it's essential to do what? That we keep our guards up. And just like God reconciled David, Samson, and Nebuchadnezzar back to himself, God also has a plan to reconcile man from sin back to him through who? Through his son, Jesus Christ. In John 3, 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Once you become a believer in Christ, the Lord will not allow you to be attempted above that which you are able to resist, but will, with the temptation, provide for you a way to escape. A world of temptation. Thank you and may God bless you. Please bow with me in prayer. Eternal God, our Father, now we ask you, be with us, Lord, in this battle against the world of temptation, lust of the flesh and the lust of the eye and the pride of life. And Lord, we thank you that regardless of what temptation we face, Lord, we are asking you now to help us to realize that you have already provided us with a way of escape. And we thank you, Lord, for teaching us that you have already overcome the world. And if you have overcame it, Lord, that we have overcame it too because you overcame it for us. 
Lord, pray that you continue to be with us and strengthen us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you have a prayer request, would like to invite the Lord into your life, or if you have any comment, please send me a Facebook message or use the Contact Us option available on our website at pmbcfellowship.org. You can also contact me with your questions on today's message. To give your tithes, offering, and donation, please visit pmbcfellowship.org and click the Give button on the top right of the page and follow the instructions from there. Remember now that God loves cheerful giving. He don't want us giving begrudgingly. Thanks again for tuning in. And remember that although we live in a world of temptation, God is faithful. He will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. So I look forward to you viewing our live feed on next Sunday at 11 a.m. right here at the pastor's desk or live feed on YouTube at PMBC Fellowship or seeing you in person for Sunday morning worship on site, Providence Missionary Baptist Church in Mount Alba, Texas, being in accordance with the CDC guideline. Until then, I want you to take care and may God bless you.